We are living in a computer programmed reality and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Another edition of the Monday Mashup. It is one fourteen thirteen, and I am speaking to you live from the South Central Outpost of America, known as Austin, Texas. Live from the Hill Country. This is Robert Phoenix. I'm your host and your humble interpreter of the day's events and how they might impact you. How is everybody? How was your weekend? Mine was pretty darn good, I have to say. I'm almost over this nano flu that has taken down most of the uh, United States and is spreading across the world, by the way. And the thing about this flu, which is fascinating, is how it kind of bifurcates into two um, symptom groups. One is nausea and vomiting, which I did not have, and the other is lung and respiratory. And you remember the old days where you would have a flu and you would, you'd you be down for maybe two or three days? I mean, you'd be in your bed, right, and hanging out and reading comic books or uh, watching TV or whatever, whatever it was. And then after about three days, the body'd rally, the aches would go away. Maybe you'd sweat a couple times, change the sheets, your PJs, and then done. You can feel your strength come back. You can feel the body begin to return to its uh, original state of vitality. And then what happens now, or what happens, or what's happening now, is that the flu. <laughs> doesn't really go away, does it? No, it sticks around and it it moves here, it moves there, it migrates through the body, upper respiratory, sinuses, head cold, nausea, vomiting, aches, pains, but it's not all at once. It's like a, a roving band of infidels that's invaded your your body, your sacred domain, stormed the castle of your health. Well, I'm here to tell you there's a reason for that. And the reason for that is that our immunity is being, in my estimation, not only threatened, but also it's being observed. Now, I have no concrete data to support what I'm about to share with you. So this is all based on supposition. But I would call it informed supposition. So one of the things that I've studied over the, over the last uh, six to seven years, obviously, is chemtrails and Morgellons. And one of the common 
symptoms of Morgellons, or one of the things that they have determined about Morgellons is that it has an intelligence in a way that is alarming. And what I mean by that is, is that it seems to be something that is self-aware. That, it, that the, the factors of Morgellons, whether they're nanoarrays or macrophages or mycoplasmic viral bots, that it has a way of communicating with other parts of itself inside of the body. And I think that there is a reason for this. I think that there are these moats, smart dust moats, that are not only sensors, but transceivers as well. And as a result of this, they are not only communicating for the uh, sort of the fractal agents of the of the Morgellons array or the Morgellons complex are not only communicating with one another inside the body, but also sending signals outside of the body. And I believe that there's something similar about this float. Now, one of the things that people don't know is that our environment is being filled with smart dust. Now, what smart dust is, is it's a nano array of very, very small machines with RFID capability. So what they will do, they being quote unquote scientists, they will take the smart dust and they'll throw it in the environment and then they will get actual real time data and feedback from this stuff via a radio signal. So they can put it in the land and they can actually begin to track things like alkalinity, acidity in the, or versus acidity in the soil, condensation, rainfall, um, even, you know, what animals, you know, frequent a certain area via pressure uh, on the land mass or uh, things like animal waste. I mean, these smart, these little tiny, tiny pieces of smart dust, these moats are constantly gathering information from the world around them and then transmitting it back to scientists who are then breaking it down and creating data sets for it. And it's also, smart dust has also been employed in the air and in the water. Uh, smart dust, this, this is how now they're tracking air quality. They will drop smart dust in the upper atmosphere. And I'm not talking about chemtrails, although chemtrails can do it. But they'll drop smart dust in the upper atmosphere. And let's say they drop it in Alaska or um, uh, Seattle, which is where the current starts, the loop current starts coming from China and coming from Japan. So what they'll do is they'll pick up all this information coming from China and Japan about things like radiation or pollution or whatever. And then they're actually able to begin to create some data sets and some um, quote unquote scientific or environmental scenarios based on that. It's smart dust. Now, why why would it not be possible to engineer a flu with smart dust? I don't think it's impossible at all. I don't. So one of the things that I think is happening, again, this is just pure supposition on my part, that I believe that the flu that we're experiencing is also, also transmitting real-time data to people that, they're, that they get. And this is kind of the intuitive thing that I'm picking up here, that they're getting real-time data, not just who's sick and for how long, but I actually think that real-time data is coming from people and literally showing how the immunity or, or their immunity or the immune system is dealing with these symptoms. Like you don't even have to go to a hospital anymore to have a report written up and to have the report filed. That is so laborious. I mean, if you are collecting data and you are depending on people filling out reports and crunching the data, Number one, the data is old. By the time it gets to the people that really need the data, I mean, it's old. It is not real time. What is happening right now is real time data, real time data crunching. So one of the things I think that makes this flu challenging is that 
not only are we dealing with something that is very powerful, but in my estimation is probably hyped up with some uh, fairly dangerous uh, agents, let's put it that way, that are making it harder for us to ditch it and to move on because people have been sick with this for what, 10 days now, 11 days. And as a result, our immunity is being, being impaired in a pretty significant way. And I would not be surprised if with an impaired immune system that there will be something else coming quickly on the heels of this first wave of flu. Keep an eye on your skies, folks. It's where it all originates from. Eye on the skies. I hope you're doing well. I hope you are well and you're keeping your immune system intact and healthy. 2013 is, uh, I've said this before, 2013 is, is, has been targeted as the year of the great calling. You just look at the numbers, 13, 15, 33, year of the snake. It's been targeted the year of the, of, of the great calling. And why? Why? Why is it? Why is it this year? Why is it this time? Is it Saturn and Scorpio? Is it the Pluto Uranus squares coming up? Are these part and parcel of what we're dealing with? I'll tell you what it is, and I do think Uranus and Aries enters into this. Last night, after the uh, the last football game of the weekend had ended, I sat down and I watched sixty minutes. I don't normally watch 60 Minutes. I stopped watching 60 Minutes years ago. I don't even really normally watch TV. I only got regular TV so I could watch the playoffs and watch my 49 There's more about them later. So I was watching the end of the game, and I know that 60 Minutes comes on after the game here in the uh, central part of the United States or on the East Coast. In the West Coast, it doesn't. It's usually followed by... Uh, a local football broadcast, sports broadcast. But they had a they had a piece on there, a teaser that really caught my eye. And the teaser was about technology and robots. And Steve Croft was the uh, was the reporter on this piece. And I thought to myself, well, I want to watch this because I think that there's something very important here. And Indeed, there was. One of the things that was a very interesting statistic, and I want you to remember this statistic, okay, because it will be bandied about in a way that seems like there is an economic recovery taking place here in this country. And in some ways, there is. But it's an economic recovery without the addition of jobs. And the piece that I saw was about the emergence of super sophisticated robots that are doing the that are doing more and more jobs that were ta- and tasks that were filled previously by people. Let me give you an example. There is a pretty large operation in Massachusetts. It's a warehouse and distribution center in Massachusetts. And what they had set up here was there was a woman or a man, people I saw were women, and what they here's how here's how we're massive stacks of small goods, large goods, whatever they were, and massive stacks. And they would have a person at a workstation with um, a gun. And the gun would have a, a beam, an LED beam. And on the screen, they'd have screens up above the workstation. And on those screens, there would be the picture of an item. And then there, there would be kind of an RFID tag associated with that item. And then the person at that station would take their LED gun and they they would press the trigger and the light beam would activate the RFID stamp 
Now, what that would do is it would send out a signal. I'm going to sneeze. Hold on. Oh, man, I hate this. You know, you're waiting for the sneeze, the tingly nose moment. It would send out a signal to a robot, and this warehouse was filled with robots. And these robots were about maybe, I don't know, um, 10 to 12 inches high. And they were maybe about, I don't know, maybe uh, a foot and a half around. They were not, they were not big. Maybe, maybe they were a little bigger than that. I, you know, it's kind of hard to tell on TV sometimes, but they were not huge. They were very low and their job was to go to the rack that had those goods that were triggered by the worker who had the LED gun and they would, they would literally cruise across the warehouse they would find the rack, they would lift the rack up, and then they would come over and bring the rack with the goods in it to the woman that needed to fill the order. And once she would take the goods and fill the order, she'd hit the LED gun and bang, it was gone. And this warehouse was filled with them. And they were going back and forth and back and forth, and they never once ran into one another. It was this very sophisticated and synchronized distribution network with essentially robot labor. Now, Steve Croft queried the guy who ran the warehouse, and he said <clears throat> that those robots were doing the job of about one and a half people. Think about that. For every two robots, there are three people that would have been associated with that job. And they have hundreds of these things in there. And how much is the cost of that robot? Now, at some point in time, I'm going to tell you, that woman that's got the LED gun that's sitting at the uh, workstation filling the order, well, she's going to be obsolete at some point as well. Then he went to another place where they had developed a robot who was much bigger, and the robot um, had a face, and he could do any number of tasks, any number of tasks. And it was a fairly sophisticated uh, robot that, that actually learned as well, because that's the big thing, right, which would be self-recognition. And this robot cost $22,000, and it would last three years, $22,000. Theoretically, what an employer or manufacturer could get out of this robot for three years, if you break that down, it's, it's about $3.50 an hour for this robot. It would uh, make human labor and capital obsolete, and, but this is where we're headed. This is where we're headed, because what's taking place now is the economy is coming back. And if you look, it's, it's coming back. There is more money being made, but there are less jobs than ever before. And we are reaching the event horizon where the human is almost obsolete. In fact, I'm going to say, I would say that the human as far as human production, human capital is obsolete. It's obsolete right now. The only thing that theoretically humans are worth at, at, at this point in time is to continue to consume and to uh, make the wealthy elite ruling class, even more wealthy, even more ruling, even more elite. And at some point, that even will be enough. If you see what's happened here, you see what's happened. In the 1990s, in the mid-1990s, 
Actually, I would go back to the early 90s because it's the early 90s where Walmart begins to set up its Walmartification of the world. The Walton family uh, had a very cozy relationship with a governor of Arkansas by the name of William Jefferson Clinton, who gave them some very nice tax incentives. And those tax incentives were used to launch their stores out of Bentonville, Arkansas, and to a larger, much larger area uh, on a national scale, national level. And what we saw as a, a key component to the mall modification of America and the world was the production of the rise in production and the exportation, the outsourcing of production in China. And here we have the, the slave wage class, whether it's China or Thailand or Vietnam or Malaysia, so where people are actually making about maybe $3 a day versus $3 an hour. And American businesses migrated to China. They were forced to migrate to China to compete, number one. Number two, even if you had some kind of patriotic um, duty and that you wanted to manufacture your goods in this country to keep jobs here, Walmart would not accept your product. You had to go through Walmart's distribution and supply chain because that's how their pricing structure had been set up. They get an immense tax break from having their goods manufactured in China. So while all that was taking place, what was happening here in America? There was a re-engineering of manufacturing in this country. It's very sophisticated in many ways. So while the jobs were being transferred to cheaper human capital abroad, here in this country there has been a, there was a stealth reorientation and reengineering of manufacturing on a technological and robotic level. So what's, what's taking place now? I'll tell you what's going to take place. <clears throat> You're going to see stories about this. You're going to see stories about jobs coming back to America. You're going to see stories about companies deciding that they're going to start to manufacture their products again in America. Well, what you won't hear about those stories is that those companies are not going to be filled with the same number of workers and that what they've done is they figured out how to undercut the Chinese at their own game. So this is, this is a real issue, not only for Americans, right, not just for Americans, but also for the Chinese and for the developing countries that have really uh, hitched their wagon to capitalism and American consumerism and made huge amounts of money as a result. And we saw, we've seen the rise of the worker class in some ways in these countries. Well, at some point, even those countries with those workers will be displaced. Then what? What will they do? What will they do with all those people that had once had a paltry yet to them significant amount of income? This is where it's going to get very tricky. And the two guys from MIT who were on the show, I forget their names, but they Steve Croft asked them, well, you know, what happens when the majority of these jobs are basically run by machines. And they looked at them and they said, well, that's the $64,000 question. But what they did is they tried to leave him and the viewer with a feeling that, well, at least we can assure you that AI will not occur, that we won't run into a situation where we're dealing with HAL 2000. I'm not so sure. I'm really not so sure. And if that's the best that they can come up with, well, that's a really 
that's a that's a paltry bow. That's a really really um, that's a really small bone they're throwing at the American people. Because what I see and what I've seen for quite a while now, and this was starting with Pluto going into Capricorn, is that people just aren't necessary. They're just not necessary. And what do we do about that? What do we do about that? Now, I think they're necessary. Of course I think they're necessary. People are necessary. One of the things that I think that will be offered as an option to compete with the rise of the robot class are upgrades, are um, the prospect of implants. And here is where we get into the transhumanist threshold. This is where AI and biology fuse together into you know one kind of unified sort of domain or species, and that's already being pushed. If you have not, no, if you haven't noticed, keep an eye on Verizon. Verizon is a company that is moving out of. It's not like they're moving out of telecommunications because they're deeply entrenched in telecommunications, but they're moving into other areas. Verizon is diversifying and getting into AI. And if you look at the latest Verizon commercials, what you'll see is somebody holding up a phone. And they're literally fusing their biology and their consciousness with their phone. And there's a group of people behind uh, glass who are like these scientists, and they keep pressing these buttons, upgrade, converting to 4G, da 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 da, da. And you see this kind of interstitial explosion of circuitry and DNA fusing together inside the virtual human, that will be the option that is going to be offered to people. If you want to, if you want to keep up with the machines, well, if you can't beat them, may as well join them. And this is where it's headed. Some people might say, "Oh my God, what? A, you're 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 just a." You're a Luddite. You don't get it. You're living in the Stone Age, buddy. Well, maybe I am. But I think that that we haven't necessarily we haven't necessarily really thought through the moral implications of where we're headed with technology. The cat's out of the bag. We're here now. But we haven't really thought through this. And um, it's going to be interesting to see where this all goes, but I'm, I just want to come back and bring this back to the original topic, which was this flu, is that at the end of the day, with the rise of this kind of sophisticated manufacturing technology, you name it, where people are being displaced, and profits, by the way, are rising, then there's really not a great need for the same number of people to do those jobs. It just makes sense on that level to, if you're a CEO, then what do you do? You, well, you, you cut back, you eliminate the workforce. And I've been saying this ever since Pluto went into Capricorn. Last night I was at a local, a local restaurant and I sat next to some people at the at the bar. I was having a an Arnold Palmer, and uh, I was having a bunless burger. And I sat there and I was listening to these people, and and they were talking about Lance Armstrong. Now, Lance Armstrong was not a great guy. Okay, he was not a great guy. He was somebody who was extremely ambitious, used everything at his disposal to get to the top, uh, including performance-enhancing drugs, which most certainly warped his personality because that's what performance-enhancing drugs do. Performance-enhancing drugs turn you into, if you have any kind of seeds of being an egotistical asshole or, or a psychopath, 
um, performance enhancing drugs will amplify those. It, it will it will amplify those tendencies and zap those seeds and grow and, and grow those uh, unfortunate personality traits very quickly. Now I'm not giving Lance Armstrong a pass. I'm just saying that everything that Lance Armstrong did was being done on the tour at the same time by his teammates, by his competitors. People made, literally, I'm not kidding you, people made billions of dollars off of Lance Armstrong. Trust me on this. Everything from endorsements through Nike, through the networks, over in Europe, the bike manufacturers, the clothing manufacturers, the apparel manufacturers, uh, the drink manufacturers, the smart bar manufacturers, you name it, it was a huge industry, and Lance Armstrong put that industry on his back. People made tons of money, and they decided to take Lance Armstrong down. Well, part of it is because Lance Armstrong, or Lance Armstrong just really, by, from all accounts, is not a very good guy. But if you look at people who are successful, really successful, are they really good people? I mean, think about it. You can, I can name you five people, you know, who are extremely successful, who are complete and utter assholes. Now, it's unfortunate that we have to look to this model of psychopathology to define success. Now, there are some people who aren't assholes and they're successful. I bet you don't hear very much about them, though. <coughs> so I'm at the bar and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this couple next to me older and the guy says uh, that Lance Armstrong he's a creep I hope he winds up on I hope he winds up on the streets homeless and destitute and I thought about this and I'm like, wow this is interesting why would this man have such a visceral reaction to someone who never killed anybody to someone who never, in all, from, from our knowledge, ever raped anybody, for someone who never, who never decided to declare genocide on a community or a, a country, to someone who didn't steal billions of dollars out of a bank account with absolutely uh, no conscience and no accountability. I didn't see any of these things associated with Lance Armstrong. I mean, I may, maybe I missed something here. But what the guy did was he made a bunch of money. He used performance-enhancing drugs. He was a jerk. And he, and, he, uh, and he succeeded. But does that warrant him winding up on the streets destitute and homeless? I mean, that's kind of, it's kind of harsh. Do you ask me? So then his wife chimes in and she says, ah, he was with that, that girl, that singer. What was her name? Cheryl Crow. She was too nice for him. Too nice for him. Well, this is what bugs me about America, really. I mean, people deal with these surface judgments that, are, that can be so incredibly damning. I even have to check myself sometimes, you know, at the, at, the, uh, at the window of damning superficial judgments. Cheryl Crow, why do you think Cheryl Crow and Lance Armstrong found each other? They're cut from the same cloth. Cheryl Crow literally stole every song from her first album, for her first album, which put her on the map, which gave her the most hits, by the way, out of any album she's done. She had a boyfriend at the time, this, uh, this Tuesday uh, music club or supper club, whatever, you know, it was like a group of musicians and hung out together in L.A. Her, uh, her boyfriend wrote most of her songs, and as soon as she became famous, she dumped him. Boyfriend goes out, cuts his own album, Toy Matinee. I played last last flight out on the show. Maybe I'll play it today before. And, you know, when she becomes successful, what does he do? He kills himself. How did he kill himself? Auto asphyxiation. So 
So Sheryl Crow, in spite of what this person may think, you know, doesn't necessarily have the best reputation in the uh, in the music business. Okay, she doesn't, at least for that record. But yet we deal with superficial judgments, on, and and it's hard to step back at times and um, ask ourselves, really, what the hell do we know? You know, what do we really know about this? And for that guy to say, I, I want him to, I, I hope he's on the street, homeless and destitute. I mean, that's harsh. That is, that is harsh. Man, why? What makes him his, his judge and juror? The woman then went on to talk about Seth Curry because she saw him on the TV screen. Seth Curry playing at Duke. The brother Stephen Curry, Stephen Curry being the basketball player who plays for the Golden State Warriors. And she said, Ah, his brother plays for the Sacramento Kings. And I'm like, Oh my God, man, this is just. That's what I saw last night. My 49ers won in a huge way on Saturday night. Huge, enormous. I've written about Colin Kaepernick before on the website and how this guy is a force of nature. He's unlike anything that the National Football League has seen before. And the reason why he is unlike anything they've ever seen before has to do, obviously, in some ways with his genetics and, you know, his, his DNA. But it also has to do with astrology. He is son in Scorpio. Pluto conjunct his sun off by one degree. He has moon in Aries. He has Jupiter in Aries. He has true node in Aries. Uh, Jupiter and the true node are, I believe, conjunct. And he has a Jupiter uh, Uranus trine as well uh, in, in uh, Sagittarius. So he is wired for electricity. And it was really interesting because at the end of the game, they had the uh, the Fox post game show, which has people like Michael Strahan and Jimmy Johnson and Howie Long and Terry Bradshaw, and whoever's doing makeup for Terry Bradshaw needs to really look at that video from Saturday night. He he looked like man. What did he look like? He looked like a. Um, Kind of a poster from the from the Restoration era. I mean, put put a put a, a wig on that guy, and he he would have looked like one of those, you know, really pancaked Restoration figures from an Ivory Merchant film, you know, or or from Barry Lyndon. I mean, he all he looked he looked comical. He had so much makeup on him. It was almost hard to look at him. He was bordering on looking like a drag queen. I got to tell you. Okay. I don't know about the makeup there. And then Howie Long, after the game, Howie Long could not bring himself to pull his head out of the desk. I mean, it was like somebody had died. Yeah, I've never seen anything like it before. Really, on um, in any of the years that I've watched sports, these guys had looked like they just attended a funeral. And the reason why is because Colin Kaepernick, in that night, on Saturday night, redefined pro football as we know it. He and Russell Wilson redefined pro football as we know it. And that we've reached kind of this nexus where athleticism and quarterbacking have have sort of merged. You know, back in the day, you know, there was always this knock on black quarterbacks. And black quarterbacks were quote unquote athletes that really couldn't play the position. Rush Limbaugh got into trouble over this, by the way. And um over the last few years, uh that um stereotype and to some extent uh actuality, that's been that's been exploded. That's blown up. Because now we have these young quarterbacks in the league, some of whom are white, 
Um, most of them are black or mixed race. Cam Newton, Colin Kaepernick, Russell Wilson, Robert Griffin III. These guys are playing uh, at a next level that is just absolutely off the charts. And they're breaking, all, not only just breaking stereotypes, but they're breaking the rules of what it is to be a quarterback in the NFL and to not just be a quarterback. In the old, in the old world, in the ancient days of the NFL, a quarterback would generally sit for a couple of seasons because the game was so fast for them and that they would have to learn it. Well, these guys don't have to sit. They're coming right out of college, and they are ready to go. Why are they ready to go? Well, part of it is athleticism. The other part is that they a lot of them get really specific training. I mean, the, the level of coaching right now for kids is off the charts. You know, if you don't have a coach with your kid by the time they're 9 or 10 years old, there's a good chance that they're not going to succeed. It's just the way it is. Cam Newton had that kind of coaching. Andrew Luck had that kind of coaching. Well, his dad was a quarterback, but this is what we're talking about here. But it's not just that. You see, the human being is changing. The human being is morphing, and we are becoming something else. And I'm not talking about the something else that is hitting us from the outside via nanotechnology or uh, the swarm of, um, you know, Borg mind that's, you know, descending into our lives. That's a whole different vector. I think that the human race or the human species is mutating, and we are mutating organically. That we are becoming something very sophisticated and more advanced than people would love to have you believe. People would love to make you into a useless eater and to keep you in the box of just mundane and average consumption. They would love to continue to shape and frame your mindset so that you're always looking outside of yourself versus inside of yourself. They would, all, they would love to continue to create the other and split the culture of humanity and the species right down the center, dividing and conquering through our fracturing of our attention, this is what they would love. Why? Because it takes the ball off of something that's going on right now. When you look at these young guys who are coming into the NFL and they're playing at an incredibly high level, part of the reason why they're doing this is a lot of them have played video games, okay? And they have developed through video games, superior abilities to manage massive levels of information and then be able to convert those abilities into these finely honed physical specimens. And what we have here are literally, you know, kind of, for lack of a better term, an organic super species and I do think technology has something to do with it in a positive way. Like I look at my son and his ability to master technology at the age of eight is mind boggling. I mean, he does stuff that at, at, at eight that, you know, f it flips me out. I mean, he can do things that I'm not even, it's like, how did you learn that? Oh, I just taught myself. So we do have an interesting relationship with technology. It's a symbiotic relationship with technology, but it's not the type of relationship where we we have to literally infuse it and take it into ourselves. That's already happening on a subtle and etheric level. Now, then we also have something else that's coming to us, and I've talked about this before, which are these uh, showers of neutrinos emanating from the sun that are soaking our planet and soaking our, our genetic code with really interesting information. And then there's a whole science now that's evolving 
around neuroplasticity, which is the notion that we as beings um, are not calcified. Like there's, you know, if you get into the brain theory, you know, cognitive theory, it's that most people are cooked by about the age of five. That everything that they have experienced between one and 18, zero and 18 months is kind of like the, the core of their operating system. And then from 18 months to about two and a half years is another layer that's put in. And by the time they reach five, they're about 90% done. This has been the common theme or the common um, sort of concept or model that has been put forward by the neuroscience, neuroscientific community. Well, there's a, there's a kind of a different school that's emerging around neuroplasticity that says that that's not true. That we can continue to grow and expand and keep our um, cellular and meta functions not just intact, but working towards our advantage to to continue to remove the barriers of thought and perception and cognitive abilities. And if that's the case, then we're on to some very interesting territory. And we don't necessarily have to employ the outer in order to influence and advance the inner. Oh, but the, the, the temptation will be there. Trust me. In the years to come, if you're going to want to compete with a machine, you're going to need to have the same kinds of hardware that a machine has, theoretically. And there may even come a time where if you don't have that hardware, if you are not willing to take on a chip or a number of chips, for that matter, then you may not be willing, you, you may not be able to participate in a certain form of society. I'm just putting this out there. I, I think that these are very valid and real scenarios that we're going to be staring down. I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, Aaron Swartz. He's a young uh, activist that apparently took his life on the 11th of January. And it's interesting the reaction that his passing is bringing up. There, he was, he was um, apparently he committed suicide. And there are about three schools of thought now that are quickly sort of emerging around his passing. First school of thought is that he was deeply troubled. He displayed these kind of Adam Lanza like qualities or characteristics. See what I'm saying? You understand where I'm going with this? And then he committed suicide. What was he about? He was about freedom. He was about protecting uh, the rights of the user on the internet. He was a, an outspoken opponent of CISPA and COPA and all of these nasty bills that would limit what we can do in this medium and domain that I'm now speaking to you through. There's another school of thought that he was suicided, that he was dangerous, that he was somebody with knowledge of internet law and deep, deep, deep connections and networks within the internet community, that he was a hacker, that he could get to information that other people couldn't, that he could articulate it in ways to other really intelligent people, which made sense to them, and therefore they could create their own network and fight off the fascistic tyranny of the machine who would want to close all the exits in the open and free borders of the, of the Internet. And as a result of that, what happens is, is that people see yet another person who's been, quote-unquote, taken out because they're dangerous. And then there's a third, much smaller group that thinks, well, maybe Aaron Swartz never really existed. And if he did exist, maybe he's just on vacation now. 
maybe this whole suicide thing is really just another ruse, another Sandy Hook, or another fake scenario in which people are now being triggered by fear, fear over speaking out, fear over standing up. And that's really not what happened at all. So there are three scenarios here, potentially, with Aaron Swartz. I've got about 10 minutes left in the show. If you know anything about the case, what happened to him, or what happened to the uh, founder of Diaspora, or uh, more recently, the guy who is the quote-unquote gun advocate that suddenly died, if you have any thoughts about that and you want to call in and share them in the next five minutes, you can do that. Um, as far as my opinion, I need to look into it more. I need to explore it more. One of the things that we have to be careful of is we have to be careful of our emotional body being played. It's just the way it is. We have to step back a little bit at times and just kind of survey the playing field and see what's going on and try to try to really factor in some of the pieces of information that may or may not fit. Because it's really easy, really easy to jump to some form of emotional conclusion very quickly. And I learned this. I had a very um, big lesson. And for me, it occurred a couple of years ago when those clowns showed up in Montana. And they, just, and they were hired by the city in Montana, the small town of Montana, to run the prison that they had built and that they didn't have enough people to stick in there to actually run or watch over. And I was like, you know, like, ah, here we go. This is it. It's the, it's the birth of the FEMA camp. These guys are being called in to run this thing. And, of course, he was one of the first people up there was Alex Jones. And he went up there, and Alex Jones wound up looking like a hero. And after it was all said and done, after the dust settled, I asked myself, what the hell happened there? What really went on? I felt like I had been completely played. Completely played. And now, after that happened, I'm, I'm really more, I hate to say it, I, I wouldn't say cynical, but I'm certainly more detached than I've ever been before when it comes to, when it comes to these kinds of scenarios. So I am, at this point, not passing judgment on what happened with Aaron Swartz. I am I'm abstaining at this point, although I do want to look more into it. I want to figure out what some of the subtleties are in this, uh, in this case. It's not my most important priority. My most important priority is getting my newsletter out, which I'm working on today, and um, hopefully it will get to you by at the latest Wednesday. If I get on it, I might actually get it out there today, and I've got some blog posts I'm sitting on. It's just a matter of moving forward in time and getting completely current and present with everything. If you haven't listened to uh, Friday's show, I uh, advise you to go back and listen to it. I actually converted it into a video, which I'm going to upload onto YouTube today. It'll just be me and Max Egan. So the Max Egan interview will be available on YouTube, and hopefully by the end of the day, um, that'll be up there, and you can just listen to that. In, in total, um, with the edits and everything, um, it'll be there. Nice, seamless conversation between Max and myself. And I do think it's worth listening to. Okay, so it doesn't seem like anybody has any takes on here in sports. That's okay. You don't have to. You can sit with it, too. You can detach and step back as well. I advise you to do that. All right, I will be back on Wednesday. And we'll be navigating the astrological matrix. And then on Friday, we'll see. I'm trying to get a, a, a guest on the show who is into the consciousness of food and really examines color and scent and all these interesting aspects of food that affect our experience of it and our health and ultimately who we are. So we'll see if we can make that happen on Friday. All right, um, so you know the drill. Use your head to discern what's real. 
your heart to stay open to what's possible. And I advise you to do your very best to be the most virtuous, if not virtual, being that you can. Because why not? You're here. You may as well make it count, right? All right. This is Robert Phoenix, and you've been listening to the Monday Mashup. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. We are living in a computer programmed reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off.